Uh, I had a medical degree from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, which is MD program in East Lansing. There's also an osteopathic uh, well-known program based out of East Lansing. We currently now have a campus in Grand Rapids, Michigan too. Uh, so that's where I actually practice. So there's, it's great to have a location of uh, medical students close to where I live and work. And I'm actually on staff at uh, the College of Human Medicine now and have taught some of the undergraduate students and serve as their student um, liaison for physical medicine interest, PM&R uh, interest group. Uh, after you do medical school to become a physiatrist, you typically do either a four-year program, which I'll get into, or a three plus one, which is a transitional year program. So I did that in Grand Rapids. Um, then I thought I wanted to move out of Michigan and change my whole life. I was single at the time and thought it'd be a great opportunity for me to go to California and just get into a whole new lifestyle. Um, and I love the program at UCLA, VA, West Los Angeles Healthcare System. So I applied there, um, you know, as you know, in medical school for residencies, then you rank programs. And so um, I matched at uh, the UCLA, VA program. I was out there for three years, loved my training, and then decided to pursue fellowship in interventional spine and move back to Michigan. Um, and then as during your fellowship year, you sit for your both oral and um, written boards, and then I passed that and was board certified in PM&R in 2014. Sorry, it's not letting me progress my slides. There we go. So um, currently, I work. I I currently work in Grand Rapids, Michigan, at the Mary Free Bed Rehabilitation Hospital. It's um, one of the largest freestanding rehabilitation hospitals in the United States. Uh, we now also have a PM&R residency program, which is great for those of you who might actually become physiatrists in the future. You can look to apply to our program. Um, I've practiced there for over five years, but prior to um, doing that, I worked at Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles. So as you can see, I've kind of bounced back and forth between Grand Rapids and between Michigan and California for the last 10 years. Um, after I finished my intern year, we moved, my husband and I moved back to California where we worked out there. Um, I would have loved to stay at Kaiser. I love California, but the employment options weren't really great for my husband in radiology at that time. And we were also expecting our first son. So we decided to move back to Grand Rapids to be closer to uh, family. And we had uh, good offerings for you know, our jobs at those locations. So I like to call it a work-life balance. I like to call it work-life harmony. I read an article about this a while ago. And Trust me, it, whatever stage of medical training you're in, it's a challenge to kind of balance whether you're studying and working out and stress relief and family. And I am wanting to tell you that I understand and <laughs> sympathize with anything you're experiencing right now. I am married to a radiologist. I did we did meet our intern year in Grand Rapids. That being said, we met before I, you know, my whole life plan was to move to California and be single and meet someone out there. Well, I met a man in Michigan before I moved out there and we did long distance for three years of medical, um, I'm sorry, three years of residency. And then I moved back to Michigan, like I mentioned for him and he finished up his radiology, moved back to California and then back to Michigan. So um, since we moved back to Michigan, we've had three boys in about five years and you can kind of see how that balance of being a dedicated physician, a mom to three really young boys, um, a wife. And then in the last year, I've actually been driven to kind of refocus and reformulate how I practice medicine even more to incorporate more of a lifestyle medicine approach. And that's what I'm hoping to bring to you today as you explore your interests in whether physiatry might be a good fit for, for you in the future. And then how do you incorporate lifestyle medicine into your practice, whether you decide to become a family practice doctor or an internal medicine physician. So what is a physiatrist? So we're gonna go through the physiatry aspect first, then a little bit of lifestyle medicine, and then I'll kind of pull it together for you and give you some options and resources. A physiatrist, if you're, trust me, you, if you don't know what we are, you're not alone because I meet people all day every day who say, are you a psychiatrist or a physiologist or a physical therapist? Well, no, we're a physical medicine and rehab specialist. It's a separate medical subspecialty, also known as PM&R, also known as physiatry. So those are all interchangeable terms for our specialty or a rehabilitation medicine physician you may hear as well. The definition of a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist is we're physicians that look at enhancing, we're functional doctors. We try and enhance and restore functional ability and quality of life to patients. So 
when they have a traumatic brain injury, a spinal cord injury, um, they just tore their ACL, they um, are post knee replacement and they still have knee pain, like how do we help them have the best quality of life? So we're quality of life physicians that focus on maximizing the patient's goals in terms of their activities of daily living. Can they walk? Can they bathe? Can they dress themselves? Um, and tend to not focus on the cure. It's kind of after something has already happened to someone, how do we help maximize their quality of life? And the great thing about being a physiatrist is you really work in a team approach. And whereas so much of medicine is compartmentalized, we are members of a team. So we work closely with physical, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, social workers, psychologists to create, um, and also other medical specialists to kind of help patients uh, maximize their function. And we are specialized to see patients anywhere from, you know, three days old to a hundred years old. The interest, why I picked PM&R, and you can see like in the background, I was an exercise and health science uh, undergraduate major. Um, the nice thing, interesting thing about PM&R is that we focus on multiple systems. So if you like musculoskeletal type things are interesting to you. Um, if you're interested in neurological conditions, like you like aspects of neurology, treating MS, ALS, Guillain-Barre, uh, rheumatologic conditions are interchangeable and are with arthritis, systemic arthritis, or patients who have had a stroke how to optimize cardiovascular risk factors. Those, all those systematic, if you like a little internal medicine, you like some musculoskeletal medicine, you like some neurology, PM&R kind of pulls it all together. And it's really um, a fulfilling and rewarding practice to work with your patients and see them make such tremendous functional gains over time. And you get to establish patient care relationships. Whereas within, if you work in the ER, you, you know, see them and they're gone. So you have to figure out what works best for you in terms of what kind of relationship you see having with patients. Physiatrists practice in both inpatient and outpatient settings. So common diagnoses as an inpatient physiatrist, we might see our spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, strokes, multiple sclerosis, um, patients who have cancer with complications, musculoskeletal conditions, like a post knee replacement I mentioned earlier, or pediatric rehabilitation. So these are the team approach. So you'll see, I work in a freestanding rehabilitation hospital that has an outpatient practice, but there are, I'm surrounded by colleagues that all predominantly work inpatient. And after patients have been discharged from the acute care hospitals, they, some of them may qualify for an acute rehabilitation stay, which means they are transferred to our hospital and we help them make functional gains to be able to return them to home or find the safest environment for them to return to, um, whether it be improving you know, how they can walk, talk, move, take care of themselves on a daily basis. An outpatient physiatry practice is another way you can practice physiatry. So we manage non-surgical conditions. So you can think of it as being like an orthopedic surgeon without the surgery. So sometimes we'll help patients be optimized pre-surgically or help them avoid surgery. I focus in the spine-related field. So spine-related pain, dysfunction. We can also treat occupational work-related injuries, overuse syndromes, um, help patients manage pressure sores, neurogenic bowel and bladder that may happen after spinal cord injuries or associated spasticity that develops or chronic pain. Outpatient physiatrists you may see in clinics when you're talking about shadowing with me, it would be, I'm in the freestanding rehab hospital, but you could be also seeing physiatrists working with, together with surgeons in an orthopedic surgeon practice or with neurosurgeons in a neurosurgery practice. When you look to become a physiatrist, most physiatry programs are three-year training programs. They start at the PGY2 level and you have to do a transitional prelim year and then you go into your advanced spot. But there's some of the programs in the United States are actually four-year programs and they integrate all four of them together. Most residency programs include a flavor of both. They have to by ACGME standards. So you get inpatient rehabilitation exposure, outpatient rehabilitation exposure, and then a mixture above. And What's interesting is when you're thinking about applying to physiatry or looking at, you know, shadowing in some of these institutions, you want to see like, what are the other months that the residents spend time doing? Are they mostly more inpatient? Are they more outpatient? And see what your interests lie and see if this program is a good fit for you. Um, our residents obviously meet the ACGME requirements and then they have um, a mixture, probably I'd say about six and six of their third year while they're with us, they do both in and outpatient um, and rotate through different disciplines. 
within physiatry. The cool thing about physiatry is that it doesn't stop with, you're subspecialized in um, our, our specialty, obviously, but you can do additional fellowship opportunities, which typically are about one year in duration, but can be a couple years, depending if you do pediatric rehabilitation. So you could be um, a pediatric physiatrist, spinal cord injury, brain injury, neuromuscular, subspecialized sports medicine. So those of you who are interested in sports medicine, it's another avenue um, because we're really trained well to do musculoskeletal exams as physiatrists. So a lot of, if a lot of um, physiatrists will practice in the sports medicine realm, but then some will choose to get a sports medicine fellowship as well. Um, hospital and palliative care, interventional pain, which is like what I did. Um, and then non-accredited ACG may also fellowships are listed below like cancer rehab, um, spine, musculoskeletal, you can do research fellowships. The difference between the two uh, isn't necessarily um, a big deal, I'd say, um, depending on where you choose to practice. So some hospital institutions or some um, some places you look to apply to, you may want to see an ACGM accredited fellowship. Some may not think it's that important and more so focus on the quality and the experience and what you bring to the table. Mine personally was a non-accredited spine fellowship at the University of Michigan. I chose this opportunity because I was surrounded by fellow physiatrists. I had excellent training. I learned musculoskeletal ultrasound and interventional pain um, procedures. But we did it with a physiatrist philosophy, which was really important to me, and um, I wouldn't change it for the world. I was able to obtain any job that I wanted to afterwards with an unaccredited fellowship, and so you have to look personally at to what suits you and what works best for you when you're looking for fellowships. Let me get into a little bit of how I practice, so pretending you were with me today in my practice, I am sitting in one of our patient care rooms right now. I work with fellow physiatrists, which is really great because I'm surrounded by a bunch of other physiatrists, about 17 other ones at Mary Freebed Rehabilitation Hospital, and you can look that up if you want to online. It's maryfreebed.com. Um, it's a freestanding rehab hospital, one of the largest, like I mentioned, in the nation, and we're located on the west side of Michigan, uh, about two hours north of Chicago in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I have been here employed since 2015. And so for my first three years of employment, I worked about five days a week, eight to five. So typical daytime hours in terms of a, a shadowing practice or what you would see you'd be with me in the office. And then I cover inpatient about six to eight weekends a year rounding on inpatient. So it kind of keeps a little bit of that inpatient flavor to my practice and allows me to see both sides of physiatry still. But I predominantly see patients in the outpatient setting. Since I had my second son um, in 2017, I've been working four days a week. And the nice thing about physiatry is there's some flexibility um, in how you practice. Um, so you can make lifestyle modifications based on what you need. So my husband is still full-time, but I'm four days a week. And I have some administrative time where in the past I've worked with our residency program. And currently I'm doing it for lifestyle medicine program development. Um, I do injections for half day. So I'll do interventional spine procedures uh, one half day a week. And then I'll see outpatient spine and pain patients the other uh, days per week. Occasionally I'll help out my colleagues and cover inpatient services. And then I do weekend rounding about four to five times per year. And that's like a Saturday, Sunday commitment, sometimes a holiday. So it'll be a three day weekend. So you can kind of get an idea of what your life would look like as an outpatient uh, spine physiatrist. So a day in the life of what I see, what kind of diagnoses do I see as an outpatient spine physiatrist? I see chronic back, neck, joint pain. I see sports related injuries. I see peripheral joint injections. So I've been trained in musculoskeletal ultrasound procedures. So I'll do some knees, hips, shoulders injections if they're clinically indicated. Um, like I mentioned in my fellowship training, I received training on how to do fluoroscopically guided spine procedures. So epidural, facet joint injections. Um, I'll do those a half a day a week. And then as part of physiatry, it's looking at patients who may have chronic disability. So I'll be helping patients address any work restrictions, work due to a work-related injury, um, helping them navigate some of the disability world. And then, like I mentioned, in the last year, I've switched to adding more of a lifestyle medicine approach to my patients. Um, since I started working on getting my lifestyle medicine uh, board certification a couple of years ago, just recently completed it um, this past November, I'm also trying to 
change how I practice to incorporate more of a lifestyle approach to helping patients make considerable and meaningful changes in their, in their lives. So addressing weight loss, nutrition, sleep hygiene. And we'll get into that in just a minute. So the blend, how did I get to where I'm at? Um, it's a foundation of physiatry education. I, the foundation of physiatry is focused on, like I mentioned earlier, improving quality of life and function after an injury or disease manifestation. And so I felt I was missing a little bit of how I wanted to practice um, with my training. And I, I knew that the time commitments we had and the time restraints in medicine, you all have probably experienced and seen other physicians uh, have, is that you, there's so many things you want to cover, but there's not much time to do it. And so I wanted to learn how to help my patients both prevent disease so that not only helping them after they've had a stroke, but helping prevent the stroke in the first place. And I knew that I didn't have all the tools in my tool belt to be able to do that where I, and how I was currently trained. So I added the addition of my lifestyle medicine board certification in 2020 through the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And you can see the ACLM.org if you wanna look up, start looking up some things and I'll put this at the end again. That's how I've started to blend my practice more to incorporate lifestyle medicine. And I'm, it's really rewarding to start helping patients both on the front end and the back end of um, disease and disability. So these next slides I, are from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I have not modified them in any way. They are presented in their whole integrity and I have to give you that disclaimer um, to be able to present them to you. This is an overview of lifestyle medicine. So what is lifestyle medicine? It is the use of a whole food, plant predominant dietary lifestyle. I'm gonna read this to you and I'm not gonna read you the rest of the slides, I promise. But we incorporate regular physical activity, restorative sleep, these are the pillars, focusing on stress management, avoidance of risky substances and positive social connectedness. These are the primary lifestyle modifications that you focus on with a patient to treat and reverse chronic disease. It seems simple, right? Like it seems like, oh, this is a no brainer. Why aren't we doing this? We should be learning this in medical school already. Well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll break that down for you a little bit. But in essence, it's not necessarily how medicine is practiced right now. You'll see that a lot of our medical, you've seen in shadowing that a lot of our medicine is reactionary. So we're responding to things and treating with meds or um, surgeries, procedures, and not getting to the root cause of what we know is actually causing these patients to have these problems and these disabilities and um, diseases. Nutrition, so helping patients choose whole plant foods that are fiber filled and they're nutrient dense, not processed, not the standard American diet, things that these kinds of things are actually hurting and impairing our health currently. Helping patients focus on sleep, we know that it affects our immune system. We know that it can contribute to additional stressors in life. Um, so helping patients improve their sleep quality. Physical activity is optimal health equation. We all know that exercise is medicine as well, but how many of us actually spend time discussing this with patients on a daily basis? A substance use, so addictive substance use, tobacco, alcohol, increase the risk for many cancers and heart disease. Focusing on stress management. What are your patient's current coping strategies? How can we modify them? I'm just gonna close that, and then, I've got the poll popping up, sorry. Um, and helping stress responses. Social connectedness, being connected to others is essential to emotional resiliency. So if you're ever interested in looking at um, parts of the world that have the best quality of life, longevity, um, overall health, let's think about the blue zones. And so one of their um, fundamental things is they have strong social connectedness in a lot of the areas that live the longest in the world. So if you're interested in getting like the Blue Zones cookbook or reading the Blue Zones, it's very insightful as to looking at the kind of diet and following along these other pillars that tend to improve our quality of life and longevity. So the history of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, where did it come from? Have you ever heard of this? Well, not many have because it was just founded in 2004 and had about 44, it has about 4,500 members. I think this number's probably grown um, in the last few years. I, when I just sat for the board, there was a, a large number of people that sat for the boards this past year. Um, it's international, so there's the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Now, if you're not located in the United States, you can look for the international um, options. And it's one of the fastest growing healthcare fields globally. 
were um, being recognized in peer-reviewed literature, research publications, and you can see the evidence page of where publications are happening um, at lifestylemedicine.org. Lifestyle changes, like the slide says, should be the first line of defense against disease. So diet, physical activity are the, should be the mainstay for treating chronic conditions, often before medication is prescribed. But how many physicians actually spend time and address with their patients? This is where the disconnect is happening. And how many patients actually understand and are educated to know, like, this is what I really need to be doing to take control of my health. So we know these things. The American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, they put these things out there. American Cancer Association puts things out there, but it's not necessarily um, conveyed at a level where our patients understand this on a daily basis and reinforced. While there's a ton of evidence-based research out there, you can see that lifestyle is the foundation for cardiovascular um, risk reduction efforts. The publications are out there, they're numerous. I'm happy to share some of the big ones with you. Um, if you can message me, I can always send you some great research efforts, um, some great literature to research. Also, if you go to the ACLM, you can find a lot of great research um, studies cited that you can read more about. And I'm gonna get into a couple things right here with you now. The so physician competencies for prescribing lifestyle medicine. So JAMA looked at a study and said, okay, let's talk about how we bring lifestyle medicine, what it means, how we bring this out. Um, and they created a list of like what a physician should know and be able to do as, in terms of being a lifestyle medicine uh, practitioner. And what's interesting in this article right over here, um, however, only 11% of patients with diabetes follow accepted dietary recommendations for saturated fat intake. And 18% of um, heart disease continue to, are, I'm sorry, continue to patients to are advised to lose weight, only 36% of the time during regular examinations. So physicians are not spending time addressing these important health issues with patients and helping them understand how their saturated fat intake actually contributes to their heart disease and how their exercise actually um, contributes to improving their quality of life and also potentially their quantity of life. We are in an epidemic. So we're in a pandemic, we're in an epidemic of healthcare costs. 90% of these costs are attributed to the treatment of chronic conditions. So you see that most Americans, more than half have chronic conditions Patients are getting diagnosed with cancer at accelerated rates. Half of all Americans have cardiovascular disease. A lot of Americans don't even know they're pre-diabetic, but one in three have pre-diabetes. How are we going to take control of this healthcare epidemic? If we don't, our healthcare costs are going to continue to escalate and we're not going to be able to keep up and treat all of these patients that need our help. We have to change how we're practicing medicine. Lifestyle medicine addresses the root cause by improving health and then reducing healthcare costs. How do we do it? Those pillars come into play. <clears throat> What's interesting is that less than 3% of Americans actually live a healthy lifestyle. And this is a statistic from a Mayo Clinic study. So these four qualifications, 150 minutes of exercise a week, a BMI under 20 to 30%, not smoking, a quality diet, uh, a quality diet, 3% of Americans. And that's, that's amazing because most Americans think, oh, I'm pretty healthy. I'm doing okay. And it's, it's not the truth. Um, so it's really, we're in desperate need of additional education. There's a fact, 80% of Americans fail to eat their recommended amounts of fruits and vegetables. We all know fruits and vegetables are important. Most of us don't consume more than enough, but we all say we're pretty healthy regardless, 75%. So there's a real disconnect there um, between what we actually do and what we think we do. Food as medicine. You're gonna hear it here and I hope you hear it again and I hope you learn it in medical school as well. And we're trying to change that in medical school right now. Food is medicine. What we eat, the phytonutrients, the fiber, all the, mac the macronutrient composition of non-processed carbohydrates, 
healthy fats, good quality proteins will change the healthcare system as we know it, will change your personal health. I am plant-based myself now, and I will, I can get into that a little bit and maybe the question and answer period if you have questions about that. But I have seen a tremendous change in my own health since becoming plant-based. Um, I grew up on the standard American diet. I had McDonald's in my, you know, in my locker when I was a kid. I was not raised by physicians, uh, ate fast food throughout my childhood, you know, in high school, started working out more, you know, maintained a healthiest weight went by working out, um, went to medical school, still didn't learn that much about nutrition. And you'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And then as we've all seen the, the changing in education throughout time, you know, is it, is, should I be doing keto? Should I be doing low fat? Should I, you know, are fats bad or carbs bad? What should I be eating? Um, continues to confuse Americans and healthcare providers as well. And so really digging into the evidence that food is medicine um, can really change healthcare as we know it. Diet is the leading cause of chronic disease and disability. What diets that are low in fruits, most American standard American diets, low in fruits, low in good quality nuts and seeds. It's super high in sodium, which contributes to hypertension, highly processed meats, highly processed sugars, cookies, carbs, low in vegetables and high in trans fats. These are what causes chronic disease. And like we said, our healthcare dollars are being spent on these chronic diseases. So how do we get to the root of the problem? We address the diet. So there has been a ton of studies and this is a real great, this is a really great study. Um, one of them is the Diabetes Prevention Program Research Group. So you can look up um, this publication as well. So they took patients through, um, some patients received lifestyle modification, which is a combination of exercise and weight loss through dietary changes. And then some patients went on metformin and they had the placebo. What happened is the patients who did the lifestyle modifications had a 58% reduction in incidence of type two diabetes. This prevented diabetes. Not the metformin, this prevented diabetes. The dietary lifestyle changes. So teaching patients, we can prevent you from having diabetes. We can also help you reverse your type two diabetes and reverse, um, get control of your life. And this is really empowering to patients. It's just giving them the education that they need to get there. How many of you actually know that lifestyle medicine has a power to reverse disease? I mean, did you know this? Did you know that you can actually, these are coronary arteries here, okay? Um, the left-hand side is the distal LAD. This is in three years difference, almost three years, 32 months. This patient did not go on cholesterol lowering medications. This patient went on a plant-based diet and reversed their heart disease. Does that not blow your mind? It should, because when I finally found this out, not in medical school, it blew my mind. Um, Dr. Esselstyn does amazing and has some amazing research. He's one, if you want to look up a great physician, he's actually on social media. He is one of the gurus of lifestyle medicine. He has written books, publications. You got to read kind of stuff. You got to read, watch and follow everything he has to say because it is incredible what you can actually do when you change people's diets and lifestyles. Food and health. So how does this all come together? Um, half of disease, um, half of deaths due to heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes are linked to diet and poor nutrition. This makes diet the largest risk factor um, for chronic disease rates and deaths in the U.S. Okay, so we know I got to eat healthy, but we, like we said, we already, most of us don't know what eating healthy really is. We all think we eat healthy. So if poor diet is a problem, how do we give patients a healthy diet to correct the problem? So if you use food as medicine, you can, if we make this the standard of care in medicine, we are going to see tremendous changes, both in patients' quality of life, their quantity of life, there are healthcare dollars spent. This is where we need to be going. We can't sustain our economic, um, our spending like we mentioned. 90% of this is spent on chronic disease. Our healthcare costs are growing. So if you look at how you can improve employees' um, absenteeism, we're going to be able to 
um, keep patients employed. And being employed right now is important to people. We're in the middle of a pandemic. People want to be able to keep their jobs. If they have chronic disease that's keeping them from their jobs, this is something we could reverse and get that out of the whole picture. So education is imperative. And this is where you guys, because most of you are not already in medical school yet, this is an opportunity for you, a huge opportunity to figure out where you wanna to go to medical school and what you wanna get out of medical school and do the research and literature background checks now so that you are going to become the best medical student and the best doctor you can be coming out of medical school. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is gonna fill in the gaps because only 27% provide the minimum 25, hour, 25 hours of recommended nutrition education. I can tell you firsthand, I did not get enough nutrition education in medical school. Love my medical school, but like many others, it's just not focused on heart diseases, learning the anatomy of the heart, learning like what medications, how each medication works, um, you know, what is a STEMI? How do you treat a STEMI? Well, how do you prevent a STEMI? Um, and so we need to really up our education in medical schools on how to promote a plant-based, what does this mean? How do we counsel our patients? How do we do motivational interviewing with our patients? Um, these are critical for our, us as both medical students and residents to learn. And so what I'm gonna tell you at the end, I'll, I'll give you a little sneak preview, is that there are ways and there's interest groups and things that you can do now to kind of beef up your education and know these things. Why is it so powerful? Because for the first time, I felt that I'm empowering my patients to own their healthcare. I go in a room now and I say to a patient, I'm gonna, I'll, tell, I'll explain it to you a little bit more in a little bit, but the foundation of anything you do comes from you. I am here to educate you. I am here to help you on your journey. I'm gonna give you the tools, but you're gonna have to probably make a lot of meaningful lifestyle changes over time to achieve your goals but I'm here to educate you. I can't fix you. I'm gonna help you fix yourself. And the patient really, when you give them the education and the power back, it's rewarding not only for you, but it's almost, it's so fulfilling for them to finally have somebody explain things to them. And that's where I said with the time and disconnect of medicine right now is that there's not a lot of time spent in this interaction. And so when you do lifestyle medicine training, you learn how to do motivational interviewing. You learn how to ask the right questions. You learn how to empower the patient, and that's not taught in medical school either really well. So this is a chance and opportunity for all of you to um, take control of this. Um, it's true healthcare. Rather than pills and procedures, focus is we make on every day. It ultimately brings us closer to or further from the health and happiness we all deserve. So focusing on nutrition, so we focus with patients on a whole food plant predominant diet. It's a primary treatment strategy. So whole food plants basically can kind of go into a little bit of that can be a little bit of variation, kind of meeting a patient where they're at. Never ask a patient to become fully plant-based on day one. Um, it's more like a plant-forward diet. So like we said, the standard American diet doesn't have much plants, fruits, and vegetables, legumes. We're kind of rebuilding the foundation of what they're eating and helping them grow towards the idealized plant-based diet that we would love them to be on. The more changes they make, the closer they are going to be towards optimal health. Sleep. Um, National Sleep Foundation recommends seven to nine hours of sleep. So you're focusing with your patients on how do we, are there other medical conditions like obstructive sleep apnea they need to diagnose? Is there other stressors in life? Is their circadian rhythm off? So you start working with your patient on what is affecting their sleep. Because we know that sleeping less can increase the risk of early death. Physical activity. So as a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, this was an area that I already felt a little bit more comfortable in. Um, obviously, when exercise recommendations for patients. So what are these recommendations? How do we spend time focusing on the importance of it? How do we make goals for the patients? Most Americans should be getting at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intense physical activity. That's about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, plus additional strength training two or more days a week. And then, or they could be doing more vigorous activities. Think about to your patients or family members or yourself that you know, how many of you are actually meeting the guidelines for physical activity? Substance use. We know substance use has many harmful um, consequences. Some patients use substances, they might not be addicted, but they meet criteria for risky behavior. 
So starting to teach her, knowing what qualifies as risky behavior, how many drinks a week is that, helping educate your patients before it becomes a problem for them. If it already is a problem for them, how do we set them up with the resources they need to cut down on their substance risky, their risky substance use, and then giving them the education that how their substance use can affect their arthritis or their hypertension or increase their risk for stroke or diabetes. Stress management, the topic of 2020. Everyone's feeling stressed. There's a lot of burnout going on. So helping patients understand the stress connection between you know, their stress eating or how cortisol is affecting um, you know, their diet and their lifestyle, how if you don't have the right stress behavior, stress responses, how can you change how you respond to situations through maybe med meditation, mindfulness? How do you change this to be in state or empower yourself to a better state of wellness? Social connectedness. So it's funny because this is, you know, we're socially distanced, but how do you remain distant but connected? Um, we are humans. We need to be connected to others. Um, social networks are as important to our health as diet, as exercise, um, as our other lifestyle factors. That's why it's one of the pillars. So doing things with other people, whether it be, you know, working out in the social connection through Zoom or like I, I have a Peloton, so I work out and, you know, compete with others. And that way it keeps yourself together because if you're not, if you're isolated and lonely, it increases your morbidity and mortality, especially amongst people who already have heart disease or lung disease or other lifestyle um, related diseases. The impact of lifestyle medicine and health determinants. So look at this, this is the foundation of the triangle. So lifestyle medicine should be the foundation. Then helping patients understand the physiology of their body, supplementing with pharmacology as needed, and then leaving surgery kind of as the top of it. So where do we get to the bottom? These are the determinants of health. Um, good uh, social support, healthy behaviors, gene expressions, culture, and medical care, all form the foundation of lifestyle medicine. Real healthcare reform. So we're trying to transform care delivery through, you can, you can practice lifestyle medicine in many different ways. Currently I practice and do individualized consults. Well, you'll, what you'll be seeing around, and what I'm working on building a whole a lifestyle medicine department with my hospital system is how do you, um, incorporate team-based care. So you can do group visits, small, small Zoom visits with, you know, eight to 10 patients um, supporting each other. And that creates that social connectedness. You add value. So as we do in more and more lifestyle medicine, as lifestyle medicine um, studies are being performed, we're going to demonstrate how we add value to the healthcare system, how we reduce healthcare costs, um, how patients are more satisfied with the delivery of healthcare system. And physicians who practice lifestyle medicine have, I know personally, I have a renewed passion towards healthcare again. I feel like finally I'm helping patients um, on all ends of the continuum of their healthcare. Um, and it's, it's rewarding. I think that's why we're all seeking to go into medicine is to be passionate about what we're doing and to come home at night and feel good about what we did during the day. So the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, like I said, was founded in 2004. Um, to transform the healthcare system as we know it. That's, our, that's the goal of the ACLM, and I'm a proud member. Um, empower and support its members through evidence-based lifestyle approaches. So the key of lifestyle medicine is we use evidence-based approaches. So going, digging into the literature, finding what's proven to really help patients reduce their risk of chronic disease and then reverse chronic disease. Uh, there are educational live um, online CME offerings. They have published a lot of patient education tools, which are great. You can follow them on social media sources. Um, they're doing a lot of research and advocacy efforts. So it's a great, if you're interested in this type of medicine, it's a great avenue for you to join. Um, and I, I encourage you strongly to do that. So who may join? Anyone. So you guys fall under the, you know, the MDDO category. And so there are, um, but we also, the great thing about team, like as a physiatrist, is a team approach here too. So. Um, I can work with health coaches, I work with pharmacists, I work with registered dietitians, and you, you get that whole team um, philosophy that I also get through physiatry that I'm accustomed to. So the great thing is, is through these slides, and this is not the end, but I'm, I have the end of the lifestyle medicine non um, 
changed slides. You can find uh, different CME certification, education. You can email about trainees for professionals and training. If you go to the website, actually, they have great resources for both medical students. Um, and since you guys are mostly pre-med, you would qualify as that as well. And you can look at what medical schools are starting to incorporate lifestyle medicine. There's also some lifestyle um, medicine interest groups that are popping up at medical schools around the nation. So maybe one of you want to start one at the medical school that you're applying to if you don't already have one. More power to you. We'd love to have you. Um, so let me talk a little bit about a patient case. And let me just kind of give you an idea of how, if you were with me today, how I would treat a lifestyle medicine patient. So say I have a 50-year-old female with a BMI of 42, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, tobacco user, she has bilateral knee pain, and she comes in with um, pain in the knees. I'd be looking at her knee joint. I'm gonna just say a focused physical exam. So she's tender over the medial joint line. She has her knees all swollen up. She has some compensatory tight hamstrings. Her ligaments all look stable. Her sensation's intact. I'm checking her hip girdle, it's weak. Um, she carries more weight around her abdomen. Her x-rays show that she has advanced tricompartmental arthritis. And the PCV referred you to her to say, oh, I want, you're a musculoskeletal lifestyle medicine expert. I want you as a physiatrist to take a look at her knees, figure out what you could offer her, um, help her fix her knee. That's her goal. I always ask patients on my intake forms, like, what's your goal for today's visit? She wants to fix her knee. How are we going to fix her knee? It's already got advanced arthritis. If you think about the traditional medical model, um, okay, well, I can prescribe you some pain medicines. Um, let me do some injections. I could do an injection. Uh, I could give you a brace. Uh, I could give you a physical therapy prescription. And, or I didn't put it on here, but I, or I could refer you to a knee replacement. Most patients think that the knee replacement is the ultimate fix to their problems. But could you do more? Well, in the traditional model, you kind of know that obviously their obesity and other medical conditions play a role, but do you have time to address it? Do you really want to dig into that, open that can of worms with that patient? Do you think the patient's comfortable with this? Um, are you comfortable with addressing these issues? That's where you have to start thinking about as your practice, how you want to incorporate lifestyle medicine. You can do more though. So when you start incorporating lifestyle medicine, I come into this room and know that I can do all of those things, but how do they fit into what one, the patient wants, and two, what I think is appropriate for the patient? So I start off really by listening to the patient and assessing their baseline knowledge and goals. So that's something that's also lacking in healthcare right now is listening to your patient. So she says she wants to fix her knee, but maybe she also tells me that, um, I kind of gauge it like, oh, what's that? wait, you know, what, what do you think about how your weight plays a role in this? Open-ended questions. She may say, oh, I've been overweight my whole life. It's not changeable. Um, I've tried this diet. I've tried this diet. I've been on Weight Watchers. And it comes back on. Um, she may say, you know, I, I don't know what to eat. I go to the fast food drive through five times a week. So I'm exploring her baseline knowledge. I'm um, exploring all of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine as we kind of get through that history and look at what, what works for her, what she's doing currently. And then I look for little opportunities to pop in education as she's saying things. So, um, well, I think my weight is all due to the fact that I have a slow metabolism. Well, addressing that, okay, well, actually, maybe when, you, when you're overweight, you actually have a pretty normal metabolism in a lot of cases. Um, have you thought about like how the food selection that you're making may affect it. Or I, I gained all this weight because I can't exercise and my knees hurt. Well, are you aware that most of weight gain and how we gain weight comes more so from what we're diet, dieting and the ability to lose weight will come more so from how we change what we're eating, not by how much we exercise. You don't have to worry about the exercise as much to lose the weight if we help you work on your diet. Finding simple ways to actually said, like I said, educate first then determine their interest in making lifestyle modifications. So then you determine how interested are they actually in making these lifestyle modifications. And so, and then assessing their confidence in making a change. So we'll talk about making goals with the patient. So I'll go into the pillars, like I mentioned, and she kind of may say some of these things to me, like fast food, I only sleep six hours a night, I stand at work, I don't work out anymore, but I'm married to a supportive husband, he's really great, he really wants me to lose the weight. Um, I'm stressed out, frustrated with diet, I smoke half a pack a day. So I look at these six pillars with her and 
I assess like what's the most important part? What what does she want to change first? And as I've educated her and her interest levels, um, I think the biggest bang for my buck would come potentially from nutrition, but maybe nutrition's not where she wants to start. So you have to let the patient lead you in some ways as well. And then I start setting SMART goals. So these SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So the patient sets a SMART goal with you. You help them pick something that they feel that they can achieve and they're confident in doing. So I will make two home-cooked plant-based dinners with my husband for the next four weeks. How, what are plant-based dinners? What is entailed? Well, that's part of my educational process. I'm not going into that as in depth with you today, but I give the patient resources as to, well, what is a plant-based dinner? Do they, do, how does she learn best? Does she want to do a virtual cooking class? Does she want to, does she already know how to make plant-based dinners? Can I help her swap out what she's currently making? Does she like cookbooks? So empowering them with the right skill set to achieve their SMART goals. And then the, the timeliness of follow-up appointments. So in this, as a physiatrist here in this case, I may say, well, you know, let's try some of these. We'll get the SMART goal going if they're on board with doing that first. Um, if she needs, you know, I try and avoid like, well, if you need an injection, these are the risk factors of injection. So if you needed to kind of break through your pain as they're making the lifestyle things, we can talk about where an injection would fit in to help you start physical therapy so that if your pain's not limiting you from doing physical therapy, um, changes in your diet can also improve your pain as the inflammation in your body starts going down by not eating such pro-inflammatory foods, you may feel better too. So giving them a whole well-rounded education about how lifestyle affects their pain, and then you set up a follow appointment. I hope that gives you a little bit, I know I've talked quite a bit, I wanna leave some time for questions, but thank you for coming today. Um, if you have, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, like I said, you feel free to email me uh, or uh, message me on those and I can shoot you an email. Some pre-med med student resources, ACLM, American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehab, both have excellent, um, they have some free programming for medical students and pre-med students. If you're interested in learning the latest nutrition research, I strongly advise you um, go to nutritionfacts.org. There's short videos, there's educational resources, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen of the foods that will um, help restore your health and wellness uh, are listed down there. He's got his Daily Dozen. Is also, you can find the resources uh, as a not-for-profit organization he's set up to really kind of help educate America and our healthcare providers as to how we need to spread what nutrition evidence is what the nutrition evidence is and where the research lies and where we need to take America moving forward. So thank you for having me and feel free to shoot me any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilmer. This was so informative. Um, the chat was just blowing up the whole time with comments <laughs> and questions and we really, we really learned a lot. So thank you so much for thank all of this information. Um, yeah. We'll go ahead and I guess we have like five, 10 minutes. So we'll take a yeah. few questions. Um, I think one of the questions that we had when you were talking about like plant-based diets, um, if you could kind of elaborate on the difference between um, vegetarian diets, vegan diets, yeah. and plant-based diets. Yeah, so great question. Um, I like plant-based as a friendly term to say incorporating whole foods that are plant predominant. So you think about fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, minimizing processed foods. So plant-based means you're kind of founding, finding that foundation in plants. So minimizing animal-based products, minimizing, you know, dairy, cheeses, all of those butters, things that fall in those categories, minimizing the processed foods. When you think about vegan, vegan and plant-based can be one and the same, but sometimes vegans practice a little bit differently for philosophical or religious reasons. So um, vegans may say, I don't choose to eat animal products because I of animal rights. And that's completely fine. And we're all, we're all together on this, but sometimes you can have an unhealthy vegan diet as well. So vegans may not eat animal products, but they may eat a lot of processed plant foods or um, which may not improve their health overall as well. So I love plant-based because I think it's inclusive. It's saying, let's just found a great, find a great foundation in plants. And then let's try and minimize the things that we know are pro-inflammatory in our body. Vegetarians obviously um, sometimes incorporate a little bit of, you know, dairy products, cheeses, things like that. Um, and that's on the continuum. They're eating more plant sources than the standard American diet. So in that, in that aspect, I find that a win as well. It's, I hope that helps explain a little bit of the differentiation between that. Um, yeah, I think that we all come to common agreement. Yeah. 
yeah, someone said that. Thank you for the clarification. They thought that it was just eating plant-based foods, but rather it's incorporating more plant-based. So thank you for kind of clarifying that for us. Um, I think another question someone had while you were explaining the difference was um, with plant-based diets or really any diets, do you recommend that people take supplements or is it more on a case-by-case basis? Where does that fit into kind of like uh, people's lifestyles? Yeah, great question. Um, so if you are solely plant-based, so going, bringing out that little last question. So if you eat predominantly plant-based um, and are not really eating any animal products, so I eat mostly plant-based, I may have some sushi because I still love it here and there. Um, you definitely do need B12 because that's not naturally um, found in a plant-based diet. So I do have patients who are on that um, definitely consume, uh, take additional supplements of B12. Vitamin D is something that also can be lacking in all of our diets. So vitamin D supplementation may be necessary, especially when you're in a climate like myself up in Michigan is, um, and that is down in Texas. But um, those are some of the two that you need to be careful about more so. But most, if you're eating a plant-based diet, you are getting a lot of the protein sources, the calcium sources, you're eating well-balanced diet. You do not need to worry about supplementing um, additionally beyond what you're eating. I think more so patients who are in the standard American diet of drive throughs need to worry about supplementing because they're just not getting all of the good nutrients and phytonutrients they need for their health by just eating the standard American diet. Great. Thank you so much. I know a lot of people have that question and they're all sharing tips and tricks for getting their vitamins in through their diet. So yeah. that's awesome. And um, it is a little, I guess, I'm, case by case, we can test things, but it's not necessarily always necessary. Yeah, for sure. Um, there was a lot of questions earlier on um, talking about when you're talking about, you know, lifestyle changes and being on a plant-based diet um, about health disparities and how it's sometimes more expensive or more difficult to access, especially when you can go to McDonald's and get a $1 burger versus a $7 salad. So um, I think that was a little concern for a lot of people. And how do you handle that? How do you kind of help patients with that? Because I think that's a big that. issue. Yeah. Yeah. So one advocacy. So, you know, the, we all need to, you know, band together for advocacy of knowing what America needs for nutrition and saying, going up against some of these, you know, dairy industry, meat industries and saying, we need to really fight for what we know is important for our patients and have these things. I mean, there's, there's not really a great subsidy in plants, but, you know, they'll subsidize milk and all of these other um, food groups. And so, yeah, I understand that concern. I always tell patients um, there are easy ways and cost-effective ways to eat plant-based. So you don't necessarily need to buy organic. You know, it's obviously a perk of those who can afford it but washing your fruits and vegetables when you get them home. Um, you can do things like canned beans, which are still relatively cheap. Um, you can incorporate things that your recipes you already have at home and just tinker with them. So I understand the concerns and I try and help patients structure meals and work with dietitians to make meals that are still cost effective um, and not prohibitive, but I, I understand that con that concern for a lot of patients, but I don't find that my grocery bills are tremendously that much higher eating plant-based than, um, than I was if I was eating a standard American diet. You don't need to buy the most expensive things at the store to be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people think it's an all or nothing and they don't realize mm -hmm. that you can make a small switches. Yeah. Um, which make a big difference. Yeah. And bananas, yeah. bananas are cheap, you know, like things like this are, are very cheap. <laughs> you can do a lot. Yeah, for sure. So thank you for addressing that. I know a lot of us had questions about that. Um, there was also a question about what advice would you give us as pre-med going into hopefully medical students, taking care of our health while in school as in like a more stressful time, both mentally and physically? So um, great question. Reaching out to, if you find that you're struggling, reaching out and maintaining social connections, I think is really critical to family or friends and engaging still and not necessarily always through social media because there's higher risk of depression through social media. 
So having real live engaging conversations with people that you know and love are really critical for your health and wellness. Um, I think also important is fitting in daily physical activity. You don't have to be running five miles, but the endorphins you get out of moving your body for 30 minutes a day can do wonders for your psyche. And I found that throughout medical school that if I just went out and moved my body away from my desk or sitting, it, it really did a lot for me personally to make it through. Um, also starting to hone in, the, like we said, talked about nutrition. What are you filling your body with? To Are you filling yourself with processed cookies that will give you a sugar high, sugar low? to make yourself feel good temporarily, or you fit filling yourself with good, well-balanced nutrients that will actually fill you up and um, give you the energy you really need to make it through these difficult times. And so learning new recipes or when you're at home a lot, trying new things can be a really great time to help improve your health and quality of life. I think those are kind of the three biggest things that helped um, pull me through medical school. And then obviously talking with your primary care doctor, if you do have legitimate concerns about other things and um, working, never being afraid to ask for help, that there is no shame in that. Great. Thank you so much for that advice. A lot of us need to hear that. So we're glad to have heard that today. Um, we'll ask yeah. one more question before you wrap up. Someone asked um, if you have any advice or if you know where we can find medical schools that include a lifestyle medicine in their rotations. Ooh. Or if that's yeah. something more that we'll have to like, kind of like seek on our own. So um, great when you're interviewing at a program to ask that. But I think if you go to ACLM, I wonder if I can just click out into this. Can you guys still see? Oh, no. You guys still see me or not? We can see that. Yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's um, not, the page is not there. <laughs> I want to see if I can just show you guys quick. Oh, oh, sorry, it's lifestylemedicine.org. Why am I typing in ACLM? Lifestyle, that's why I didn't leave it. If I can just show you, um, I think that there is a link under, let's see, it's under academic programs. So academic programs 2020. So if you go down here, and you go to medical schools, you can actually acknowledge these medical schools have incorporated lifestyle medicine curriculum. And so this is a really awesome resource. So you can see that some of them have like tracks and subspecialties, um, core curriculum starting in their M1 year, required courses. So these are like some medical schools you may be thinking about applying to. And so there's at least six right now. They are updating this all the time. Um, and then you can go into residencies too. And so you can see residencies that have incorporated lifestyle medicine. And then there's interest groups too. So you can see at all these medical schools where there's interest groups already. And if you want to start one at a medical school, then I would really hope that you could do that too and really start the revolution with me. Thank you so much for showing us. That's an amazing resource. So yeah, a lot of people are really happy about that. So thank you. And I guess the last question that we have for you when we as we wrap up is, what is the last piece of advice that you would leave us pre-med students with um, going through everything during the middle of the pandemic that's hopefully coming to an end? Um, be happy that you're not in medical school yet. <laughs> I, don't know. Um, I think that we have to ma maintain hope that we will have the kind of experiences that you all ideally will want in the future to be able to make the best decisions as to the type of medicine you want to practice. Uh, I think that you guys are all here and you're doing an amazing thing by looking at all these different specialties and getting information. Please don't give up. I think it's worth the effort that you're putting in. When you get back and we get back into medical school, yes, there may be more virtual for some time being, but I'm I'm really optimistic that we'll be able to return to more in-person because so much of medicine needs to be in person. And we're having medical students in our hospital systems now too. It's, I think that the worst is over. And I think that moving forward, you guys will all have experiences that you will, you'll love and um, be valuable for you. So please keep the good fight. Like I know there's so many medical students out there that are struggling right now with whether they defer 
you know, their years that they're currently in because they don't necessarily want to pay to be just in virtual. And then it's probably hard for you guys in college to understand that, to do this as well. And I, I, I sympathize with you because I know it, it must be tremendously hard. Um, I've never had to experience anything like this, but you will be stronger for it. And I think that you can all make it through and we're here to support you whenever you need. So feel free to reach out to me if you need any support in any way. Thank you so Thank much. You so if you open up the chat there's so many people are saying thank you they really appreciate it and a lot of people are considering lifestyle medicine right. and um, they're so excited about everything and they loved all the information that you're able to get yeah so feel free to reach out to me at any point in time I'm happy to help you guys on your journey like I said you can do lifestyle medicine in any specialty you can be internal medicine family practice physiatry you don't have to be a physiatrist but I'd love it if you were a physiatrist too so <laughs> thank you yeah. we linked your Instagram one more time in the chat so if anyone has any okay, other thanks. questions go follow Dr. Volmer and hopefully she'll answer those for you thank you guys, guys. bye right, have, have a great rest day. of your day thank you bye. have a great day bye take care thanks ladies bye you too thank you bye and then if anyone has any questions